That's when becoming a National Board Certified Teacher um, gets them past that five to seven year, um, what do I do next? And it is um, seen once you become National Board Certified, you are considered a teacher leader in their eyes. So that gives you that extra boost. Some of our National Board Certified Teachers have gone on to become adjunct professors at local colleges. They work for New York State Department of Education and they mentor new teachers and they get student teachers in their classroom. So they then become teacher leaders in their buildings. Um, when the teachers go through the process, it is a very reflective professional development. The first component is a test of your content area, but the other three components are written and all of them have reflective pieces of writing that they must do and they're to reflect on their practice. And the community involvement is increased because the fourth component that a teacher would go through the process is asking teachers, how do you know your students? Who have you worked with to talk to to learn about the students that are in your class? Community members, counselors, support providers, uh, uh, their former teachers, how are you knowing the most you can know about these students that are in front of you. So um, these are just some ways that it benefits the students. It's cost effective for the district, but it also benefits teachers. And I am happy to come and speak to any of you at any time about the process. And um, I think earlier in the year, I had sent out an email about an article that was in Education Week that it talks about um, only a little more than one in four teachers said they would recommend their profession as a career for a friend or colleague. By contrast, 42% of teachers said they would actively try to convince the friend not to become a teacher. And to put that in context, active duty military personnel are more likely to recommend their jobs to others than teachers are. But teachers that go through the national board process, are they have higher morale and better retention and increased community involvement. So I just wanted to share with you the opportunity that teachers have for National Board Certification and I'm happy to talk to you anytime about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Claudia. You, Claudia. <laughs> Gassa, is there someone here from Gassa? Mr. George, long time no see, how, how are you? Doing? Good evening. I'm Brian George, Assistant Principal of Phoenix Academy. And on behalf of all of GASA, I want to thank the entire Board of Education, Superintendent Kathy Groutman, Assistant Superintendents Mike Zaptis, Dr. Kathy Colicchio, Dr. Valerie Payne, Mr. Romeo Colelli, and I know Dr. Beth Bentley right now is probably listening to the live broadcast I'm sure from home. She is. <laughs> yeah. But we want to thank you for your ongoing support for the work uh, that we do as administrators. During this time, as a GASA member, I'm able to share the wonderful events and impressive accomplishments in ongoing professional development that is happening around the district. <coughs> this month, I reached out to every building administrator about honoring and celebrating the work and dedication of our district office GASA members, and the feedback was amazing. As you will hear, the responses provided by our building administrators about our district office colleagues speaks volumes to the culture Kathy has been promoting. It's been promoting within Greece. Four words that sum up the responses are collaboration, coherence, excellence, and equity, which all just naturally align with the strategic plan. I have many pages of responses from the building administrators, but will share just the highlights with you tonight. Jeremy Smalling has been a partner, a colleague, and a collaborator with all of the schools in the district since moving to district office. In each of his positions, he has supported the buildings in some of the most difficult work, <laughs> continuous school improvement. Jeremy listens and helps to problem solve issues while pushing on us to dig deeper and reflect on our work. Stacy Brindisi, Lori Ruggieri, Melanie Stevenson, and Christine Baker are our resources for special education. They have all gone above and beyond to support our buildings, specifically in professional development for our admin teams and our special education teachers. In their roles, they all help us to understand special education compliance, part 200 of the regulations, and our expectations around special education. Tasha Potter 
while a new addition to district office staff. She has already made her mark in moving conversations and practices around equity. Her exuberance, energy, and expertise are a true asset to our entire district. Susan Pettifer has done an amazing job orchestrating all things literacy for our schools. A particular example of her dedication is when she took time out of her busy schedule to provide specific reading strategies at a CSE. More importantly, she partnered with the teachers and the teaching assistants to provide additional guidance and support to build literacy capacity. Her dedication to our students is recognized and is much appreciated. Todd Smith is a resource for everything. Though his specialty is in math, he is a leader who thinks strategically and can provide support in all areas. Todd has been instrumental in guiding PLCs on the use of iReady and the analysis of data that is generated through this system. The time he spent with PLCs has enabled staff to implement a full model of RTI in support of student achievement. Adal Mater is a district science guru. Adal comes to the buildings to support teachers with new content, ideas, and structures. She has been saving grace for many teachers over the years. Anna Maria Falzaramo has been an important asset with guiding our LOAT teachers. She has supported Westridge with administrative responsibility when the principal and assistant principal were both out of the office. Keena Smith is a data expert who is able to help support buildings in many different ways. She supports roster verifications, ESSA updates, and data analysis. And Kathy Richardson has been instrumental with the success of AVID programs. Kathy has fostered connections between AVID schools, funded field trips, and trainings for staff. Without her communication and feedback, our district's AVID programs would not be where they are today. And Tom Mariano has, has all the answers when it comes to technology. He has been a great support for taking the lead with the implementation of the one-to-one -one Chromebooks, the conversion to Gmail, and keeping every district staff member updated by emailing weekly technology tips. And Norma Vetter, in her new role as Coordinator of Humanities, has taken the lead with bringing our ELA departments together to vertically and horizontally align our ELA curriculums. This has increased collaboration and camaraderie amongst all ELA teachers in the district. The guidance and direction from the DCIA teammates on topics such as Every Student Succeeds Act, School Improvement Planning, Special Education, and guiding us through content-specific questions in the areas of curriculum and assessment has helped to increase student achievement across the district. Every DCIA member is a valuable member of the GASA team and as a colleague and a friend of our DCIA staff, it was an honor being able to share this upbeat information. And to everyone on the Board of Education and on behalf of GASA, thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you, Mr. Thank George. You. <laughs> I don't believe I have anyone here from AGCEPT. Swing and a miss. Gus, swing and a miss. And Teamsters, swing and a miss. Alrighty, move along to staffing. Can I somebody move the following, please? Be resolved, Board of Education, Agree Central School District approves the staffing appointments. Moved by Vice President Millar, seconded by Mr. Maloney. Any comments, questions, or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes 8 to 0. Can I somebody move the following, please? Be resolved, Board of Education, Agree Central School District approves the student teaching placement recommendations. Can I somebody move that to the table, please? Moved by Mr. Valsante, seconded by Mr. Oberg. Any comments, questions, or concerns on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes 8 to 0. Moving on to item 5.01, what everyone is waiting for, the superintendent's budget presentation. Yes, and we're experiencing I guess they're not really. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure. We are struggling right now, and it's not necessarily. Is it uh, coming? Is it coming? See it. It's, I don't know. <laughs> Could go either way. Mm -hmm. The recordable audio. Oh, look at that. It's a sign. That's one way of trying to get out of a presentation, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I won't Kay. count my blessings until it actually works for the whole thing. Okay, I think you can just wait a second. What's that? Let Johnny get seated. Oh, 
Hello, Mr. Swicky. Welcome. Apologies. Apologies. Good evening. I'd like to start by formally recognizing and thanking a few people before I get started tonight with the superintendent's budget proposal for 2019-20. Um, let me start just by recognizing Romeo, Janine, the members, all of the members of the finance department who've worked tirelessly over the last few months to help us construct this budget. And also to the members of our cabinet who've collaborated and helped immensely with this process. There's nothing easy about this, and it's required long hours, difficult conversations, and decisions that have not been easy. I also would just like to take a minute to thank all the people in the audience. So I, I swear I didn't ask them or make them come. These are <laughs> staff members um, and administrators who have come because they've been part of this budget. Um, they've been part of our district and are committed to the work. So um, I sincerely appreciate them being here tonight. With all that said, I'm excited to share with you um, the 2019 budget proposal. On my first day as superintendent, and I think I've repeated this story about 100 times, I talked about ownership. And I specifically talked about ownership because uh, my point is when we own something, we take better care of it. When we own something, we make better decisions based on that. And I can say with complete certainty that we have taken great ownership with this budget and with the dollars um, of our taxpayers. So I'm excited to share with you what we've been able to put together um, with some really specific challenges that you know as, as good as anybody um, as a board, um, the challenges that exist for us in today's uh, world. So with that being said, I'm gonna start with this slide, which is a familiar slide. So several years ago, we sat down and Romeo and I were both pretty new, and it was important for us at that time to put together a predictable um, process. So at the time, we weren't necessarily following the same exact process from year to year. And so what we wanted to do was really sort of patternize this because we recognize that putting together a budget at any time isn't easy and it can get emotional. So we really came up with those, those steps as a way to make this as clean and simple as possible, knowing that it's complicated and knowing that it can be difficult. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side of this slide, and I'll get to those steps as I walk through the presentation tonight. On the right side are the challenges that have existed um, for many years now. So, and it's important for me to point those out, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about those challenges on the next several slides, because they impact every one of the steps along the way, and they impact really all of the decisions um, and why this is so difficult. So things like inconsistent state aid revenue, the cost of unfunded mandates, which I'm gonna speak about in a few slides, um, the tax cap, which we have now um, been under for eight years, um, declining enrollment, and then also increased student, family, and community needs. So with that said, um, just to dig in a bit to the challenges, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on the negative, but it is important from a context perspective. This show, shows the declining enrollment countywide. Um, you can see specifically Monroe County, you can see the west side, and you can see Greece. So it looks pretty flat, and we have semi, and we have flattened out over time, but we have lost enrollment. And with a loss of enrollment, there's also loss of revenue. So it's just important to keep that into context as we go forward. This slide sort of does probably a better job of really sort of telling um, a better picture. So you can see the overall enrollment for the last 10 years has gone down. So this, that first column is 2008 and then it brings us to now. And then you can also see um, several other factors. Most notably is our percentage of students with, um, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, which over the last 10 years has increased over 22%. Um, <coughs> While the other percentages are smaller, so if you look at the homeless um, increase or if you look at the number of special education students that have increased, those are more modest, but they, they represent significant dollars. So I, I point this out sort of every time I talk about special ed because I read this several years ago, but New York State um, has over 200 additional mandates for our special education students in that world than any other state in the nation. Um, and with any sort of mandate, or many man mandates, comes funding and money. So um, while those percentages may not be huge, they can represent pretty significant dollars. 
So that gives you a little sense of, um, of our population <laughs> and what we're working with. So when we get into the actual steps, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, I'll go through the steps and then what I'll do is invite Romeo to come up and actually walk us through the dollars which you've been um, presented with several times already along the way. But this first step is really this idea of how do we assess funding. Um, and we really need to stop and spend some time just um, getting a big sense of things. And we do this in December and January, but we're really just looking at sort of what do we typically spend to run the district. Um, if we were to roll that over and if we were to sort of assume things about our revenue. So basic things that we can assume related to our reserve funds, fund balance, tax levy, and state aid. So we can make some assumptions at that point. Um, and then we can also look pretty clearly at what we spent the year before and roll it over. Every year that we have done that, we do that just to basically determine if there is a surplus or a gap. And I have never, ever been in the position of having a surplus. <laughs> I, I think there may be some places out there that that's happened with, but we have yet to have that happen. In fact, um, the four years that I've been superintendent, we've had significant, significant gaps um, when we've done this work. So that sort of just gives us a sense of sort of where we stand and what we're facing. In step two, we're really looking at making sure we've identified priorities. So we can't go forward with a budget process unless we've been real clear around what's important to us and what are we gonna sort of stay true to in terms of the process because it gets kind of ugly. Um, so the idea here around minimizing impact on students in the classroom, that's always the first thing that we talk about is really wanting to not do that. Um, maintaining current programs and supports that are working for students. <coughs> we don't keep all programs going, I'll be clear about that, because if they're not working, we wouldn't maintain them, but things that are working and, and where kids are making progress, yes. Our continued focus on wellness, social, emotional, and culturally responsive education, very, very clear priority for our district. And then maintaining extracurricular opportunities. The students who are here for robotics, great example of, of why we do that, because that actually makes a difference and gets kids to school in so many ways. And then when we get to step three, we're really looking at how can we investigate economies. Now, the point that I wanna make on this slide, so you can see a lot of different ways that we do this, and I can talk about all of them. A lot of them are self-explanatory, but a piece that I wanna make here, or an important point, is the importance of consistency and the importance of some experience. So this is a slide where what, what occurred to me was how grateful I am to have an experienced cabinet and to have a cabinet who's worked together for several years. So to have Romeo, to have Beth, and I know Mike, you're new to us, but um, Kathy Vale, we've been through this process several times together, so we've gotten pretty good at certain things. So I could say, for example, staffing to enrollment, that's one of the, the biggest places through the years that we've been able to save money. We've gotten really good at that. We don't have a lot of fluff out there. We don't have a lot of extra positions out there because we've gotten good at that together. Um, we ask all of the departments that we, that we oversee, we ask them to really do a line by line review of their spending and see where we can reduce and find any economies. Um, obviously filling retiree positions with someone coming in at a lower cost helps us. Um, the bullet around supplementing educational needs with grants and or BOCES. That was one probably this year that we found the most savings. We were able to move some things to our title grants. We were able to move some things to BOCES where we can get aid back. Um, but those are ways that we find economies. Um, the last one on that page, like furniture supplies, we've been doing that for several years now, but we can't keep doing that to the same department. So what we have, for example, is some buildings and grounds as an example, um, where they've reduced some of their spending in terms of equipment. Um, and then we've added that back the following year. So we try not to do it to the same departments more than once, but it's a place where we can go. Then when we get to step four, it's the actual putting things onto paper in terms of the budget. And in order for anything to be put into the budget, it has to be directly aligned with our strategic plan and the goals noted here. So what I wanna do for you as I walk through the goals tonight is just make sure you're clear around what is being supported in this budget. And it's probably not everything. So that I don't, I don't wanna to talk to you for three hours. But, um, but essentially, if I go to step, or, or goal one, excuse me, st strong curriculum instruction and assessment practice, what I want our board and what I want our community to recognize is really what are we supporting in this budget that matters, that's related to that goal and that's aligned to our strategic plan. And what I see and what we've put here is providing equitable, 
equitable supports for all students. What I mean by that is things like academic intervention for our students, for math and for ELA, we know that we're, that's still provided, that's in this budget. Things like our Twilight Academies that provide support for our students after school, um, still in here. Things like boot camps for students um, to get credit and learning recovery, those are still in there. So those things that are working, we have maintained um, and we do that for our students. Maintaining high quality music, art and elective programs are still in there. So oftentimes you'll hear districts talk about having to cut music or they're cutting library or things that aren't mandated. We have not done that. Um, and we've been able to maintain our programming. In addition, You'll see specifically um, early intervention in terms of, again, how do we, how do we meet the needs of our youngest learners, um, as well as increasing access to college through programs like our AP, IB, dual enrollment, AVID, and early college high school. If you know, walk away from anything around Greece is recognizing that what we offer in that bullet, that second bullet, is not even comparable to anybody else in the county. Um, when I talk to Rotary and when I talk to community groups, for them to recognize what we have here, that kids can take AP Computer Science, that they've got a wealth of opportunities, um, is unique um, and really a feather in our cap in terms of what we, what we do here in Greece. As well as promoting career and technical education pathways. So all that work that you've seen in our um, course offering book, all the things that you've heard about and things that we've um, we've added through the last several years, those are, those are pathways um, that are helping grow our students and get them ready for um, post high school life, whether that be college or career. And step two, this is just the idea of empowering staff. And again, what, what you'll see here is the majority of the money and the budget in this um, that supports this goal um, specifically is for professional development. So you'll see things in here particularly to support and to continue to support social emotional learning and culturally responsive education. You'll also see um, a ton related to our content area. So as social studies and science comes up for curriculum review, there are dollars put in here to make sure that they support that review and any work that might need to happen in those areas. We're working to make sure that we broaden voice and we're really listening to teachers. We've still maintained our teacher leaders and we use them as boots on the ground to be able to give us feedback around what our teachers need. So that continues. Um, we continue to promote positive culture and staff wellness with a lot of our offerings. And then refine, refining hiring practices. This is some pretty significant effort that we're doing around uh, best practice with hiring, but also taking out hiring bias. Um, so when we look at sort of how we actually gather teams together um, to actually do hiring in the spring and the summer, um, there'll be work done with those groups as well. Goal three, engage community. So again, this goal is really the work that we're doing around community schools and that will continue. That's in this budget. So we want to continue to expand that model. We want more and more schools sort of coming on. Um, most of this work does not entail a lot of dollars because we're talking about partnerships. We have over 130 partnerships um, with community organizations and nonprofits. Most of what we get from them is time, in-kind service, and then we've also gotten dollars. Um, we've gotten a, um, a great deal of alternative revenue from some of these partnerships. And then again, with Vale's leadership in terms of the, the family and community engagement work, we're really working on promoting voice. An example of that might be, for example, our parent universities that we've hosted this year. Um, but we continue to want to expand those things. <coughs> In terms of goal four, we have a safe and ha healthy environment. Um, this is a high dollar area. So when you look at sort of where we spend money, this is significant. We have um, over 35 security officers. We have two SROs that are still maintained in this budget. We have teachers and people who've gone through over 700 hours of training related to safety and security so that I would say, bar none, our teachers and staff are prepared better than anybody else in the county and the state in terms of safety procedures. You all have heard that. We continue to hear that. So we have, we have confidence in that. But it costs. It costs time and money. And in addition to that, there's funding for additional mental health and behavioral support positions in this budget. And then the last goal is really around efficient operations. So we're really not talking about necessarily ads um, or dollars, but looking again at what are we doing related to that. And um, again, realizing some savings in terms of retiree um, costs, 
um, moving positions from the general fund to other funds like our title. So we're do being super specific about that and, and strategic about that. Analyzing and adjusting ERS and TRS expenditures. And again, continuing our work with high volume discounts for frequently used supplies. So that continues and we keep looking at things. And again, this is where our experience together, finding ways or asking questions about what might we be able to do um, more efficiently and save more money. <coughs> So what this does here is it shows you um, from a staffing perspective what you can expect. So sometimes there's dollars associated with things and sometimes there's dollars associated with people um, and positions. So you'll see here um, an additional, so it's really some adjustments, an additional 9.6 um, that are in this budget. You will also see very, very clearly that this is connected directly to our strategic plans. So we have our equity principal on special assignment. We have a reading specialist that's gonna be supporting um, the IRLA work that we're doing. So IRLA is um, uh, a program that we've been using where we've seen great success in terms of improvements with our third grade reading. Um, we wanna extend that to other grade levels. Um, so that position won't be a long-term position, but it'll be short-term for the next year or so to make sure that we get that implemented correctly. Uh, behavior interventionist position, a speech language position. And again, speech language is generally tied to um, IEPs, um, an additional substance abuse uh, prevention person. And again, um, we have one for four high schools. Most districts that are a third of our size have at least one. Um, with the vaping issues that we have, with the um, mm -hmm. impending sort of legalization of marijuana, we only anticipate that getting worse. And we're not doing what we could and should be doing for our younger, younger students. Um, so our hope is that that will help with that. You'll see with elementary and secondary, those are, those are um, fairly minor, um, and those are done by staffing to enrollment. So you'll see a, a slight reduction at the elementary. You'll see, um, it seems 4.2 seems like the highest number, but that's not huge when you're talking about four, um, four high schools um, and secondary buildings. And then Phoenix Academy, there's an addition of 1.2 there, but again, that's continued because or we've had increased enrollment there, which you've been aware of. And then you'll see over here, in terms of the non-instructional world, some decreases. So we have obviously uh, 15 down in terms of bus drivers, and that's because of our contract with um, Ontario. So that's all of my piece. And what I'm going to do, uh, not all of my piece, I'm going to actually turn it over to Romeo, and then I'll come back at the end for a few pieces. But he's going to walk us through um, some of the financials. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. <coughs> Uh, what we thought we'd start off with uh, for the evening, and because of timing, uh, the last board meeting we weren't able to get, we didn't have the legislative runs, we didn't have a legislative budget, so we thought we'd get a little bit caught up on some of the key components in the budget that was recently passed. Uh, first item is uh, school aid increased by just over a billion dollars, as you might recall. Uh, advocates for uh, school funding were asking for around 2.1, 2.2 billion. We got about $1 billion, uh, brought up the state education funding to about $27.3 billion, or about 3.6% increase over the 18-19 school year. Um, specifically within that, foundation aid was up about uh, 900 in, or 900, $996 million to about $618 million, um, which was significantly more than what the governor had put out um, during uh, his presentation in January. But still, there's no plan to fully phase in the foundation aid formula. Um, there were requests in order to ask for a three-year or a four-year phase in. That is not going to happen. And uh, given the needs of students within all our districts, uh, $1 billion, although it is an increase over 18, 19, it's nowhere near the amount of money that is needed for districts to operate today. As a side note, I read, it, looked at a chart. Um, if the foundation aid formula were in full phase as of today, to us alone, we'd be getting in the neighborhood of 17 or $18 million more in foundation aid than what we're currently receiving. So again, a very significant item, um, but it hasn't been fully addressed at this point. <clears throat> A uh, second item component that came out was the tax cap. The cap, tax cap was made permanent. 
uh, without any changes or modifications. Uh, there were requests, for instance, to make the uh, minimum increase 2% so that w districts could budget a little bit more steadily rather than having it 2% one year and 0.5% another year depending on CPI. That was rejected. Um, secondly, another item would have been the request to include pilots in the tax base growth factor, which would again help us increase our base. That was rejected along with a variety of other items. So the tax cap is permanent uh, starting next year, starting now, uh, without any modifications in there. Uh, TRS reserve, one request that was made was the establishment of a teacher retirement system a reserve fund similar to what we have for the employee reserve employee retirement reserve fund that was granted that will take place immediately effective April 1st um, two components of that we can begin to uh, establish that reserve as a sub fund of the ERS reserve districts are able to uh, deposit 2% of total teacher salaries into the reserve with a cap of no more than 10% of the total teacher salaries um, at any one time. So uh, in all likelihood, we will be coming back to the board um, maybe in May or June with a request to potentially establish a TRS reserve as approved in the state budget. Uh, building condition surveys um, are gonna be spread over five years. As everyone's aware, every five years, all districts in New York State complete a building condition survey. They all get sent into the state. Causes a lot of uh, headaches in terms of everyone, one, approvals, uh, two, putting projects together, and three, everyone's fighting for the same contractors out there because all the, con uh, the um, projects are being done around the same time. So the idea, which is a plus, will be that certain districts will start in 2020, a fifth of the districts will do a building condition survey in 2020, another fifth will start in 21, 22, 23, 24, so that one fifth of the districts are done every five years should make things a little bit easier. Another proposal that was uh, driven by the governor was to take our reimbursable and expense aids and combine them into a one services aid block fund that would mean taking for instance BOCES and transportation and textbook aid and rather than reimbursing at your ratio um, based on what you spent the previous year you would only get a two percent increase on that entire block regardless of what you spent the previous years that was rejected and will um, not take place for next year and then uh, lastly the equity funding component. The governor's budget proposed schools through a funding um, formula that they had for foundation aid would identify underfunded or high need schools and districts would have to submit a report on how and, and dedicate 10% of the foundation aid up to 70% of the total, 10% was the threshold, 70% of your foundation aid total to be spread out amongst the schools identified by the state. Um, it would be very similar to the transparency reporting that we're already required to do. That was rejected. However, there will need to be a written narrative sent to the state um, by September 1st of each year describing how we are going to equitably distribute funds um, to each of our underfunded or high need schools. So, Little bit of a compromise, not as uh, robust as the governor wanted, but there will be some uh, reporting uh, narratively to the state for that. So how did the legislative budget compare to the executive budget and how did it affect us here at Greece? That's what this slide is looking to do. So looking in the middle of the page, uh, we're comparing the executive budget to the legislative budget with a variance on the right. Um, as you'll see in the top, uh, for basic operating aid, which is foundation aid, went up $404,000. As you recall, as we, above what the governor provided us, as you recall, our estimate in the budget was hopefully, and we were confident that we would get uh, 1.5% more than what the governor had given us 
based on history, uh, we actually ended up with about two-thirds of 1% above what the governor had provided, rather than 1.5%. So that was a little bit of a shortfall for us. Moving down to the categorical aids in buildings, uh, you'll see that we uh, were reduced about $183,000 there. We believe we st uh, that that is due to timing. We're still taking a look at that, um, but that should catch up with itself over time. Our uh, instinct is that this is some reporting that either got in um, different than when the snapshot was taken by the legislators or uh, hasn't been submitted yet. So that will catch up, but we are able to take care of it. Um, going down to uh, the bottom of the page at BOCES, again, we uh, had a reduction of about $161,000. Um, that is due to timing. So when the governor's run on all of this, when the governor does his proposal, it is a snapshot as of November, October, November. When the legislature does their proposals, it is a snapshot as of January 15th. So any changes that were made after January 15th are not reflected here, yet there have been reports and other items submitted that just weren't captured at the time of the snapshot. So we are confident that uh, the $183,000 and the $161,000, we will most likely receive most or all of that during 1920, but we did not want to make an adjustment to the budget and count on it. So to be conservative, we left it out as a reduction and covered it by other means. If we get that funding or when we get that funding in 1920, it'll be a plus for us rather than us um, looking to cover a hole for a quarter of a million dollars early in the year. On the right, you'll see um, <clears throat> what transpired as a result of the legislative run. So in the governor's budgeted aid, we were receiving $98.8 million. We had estimated 1.5% in foundation aid or 941000 to get to $99.8 million. As you'll see in the legislative run, we ended up at 99, under $99.1 million, which created a shortfall in the budget that we presented on the 26th of just over $711,000 as a result. Well, how did we address that? Well, on March 26th, we had come back to the board with the balanced budget at $237.8 million. The items beneath that on the right and the other revenues on the left were how we balanced the budget as of March 26th. On April 1st, when we received the runs, we identified the $711,000 shortfall. And what we were able to do to get it balanced for this evening is on the left-hand side, we increased our appropriated fund balance from $6 million to $6.3 million. That took care of 300000 of the 711000 On the right-hand side were the other adjustments that we made. And to the point of one of the previous slides uh, that Kathy had shown where we had moved expenses to other funds, you'll see that uh, there's a 1.6 FTEs moved to the food service fund. We've got a 0.75 of uh, facility operation position moving to the capital fund. Buildings and grounds, um, as Kathy had mentioned, has agreed um, as, as a reduction for next year uh, to about $100,000. And again, we will look to move that around and possibly and add it back for the following year, but we, they can do without $100,000 for next year. The 0.5 tech a district-wide interventionist position, which again was able to go to another funding source, and we reduced our unallocated funds that we keep as contingency for staffing issues and staffing adjustments that need to be made during the year. We reduced it by 100,000. With that, we were able to get to a budget, a balanced budget of 237.3 million dollars. Taking a quick look um, at the revenue summary. You can see our state aid reflects uh, the new number from the legislature, $99,073,000. The tax levy is at $110,973,000. That is at the maximum allowable tax limit, 2.39%. So we are in compliance with the tax cap. 
Other sources of revenues, um, up about 159,000, primarily uh, health and welfare services and some interest uh, revenues that we had. The 50,000 for the federal sources is an increase as Medicaid related. The transfers in internal, um, transfers in internal transfers, primarily related to the debt service fund. So as you recall, we are gonna bring over additional funds from our debt service fund in order to uh, keep the capital portion of the cap level. So we are gonna bring over a million three over from our debt service fund. And again, we appropriated, the fund balance was increased by $300,000. Total increases on the revenue side, 2.58%. Just taking a quick look at uh, the chart on what it represents, you'll see that about 88% of our total revenue comes from state aid and the tax levy with 47% coming from the tax levy, 41% coming from state aid. On the expense side, quick snapshot, uh, we did this by functional group. So general support up about 1.4%. That's primarily the Board of Education uh, finance, central services, a variety of other um, items, um, mostly salary increases per contracts make up that increase there. Instruction um, up about 3.52, primarily related to uh, salary increases, um, reallocation of some positions to instruction, i.e. the deputy position used to sit in the superintendent's budget, which is in general support. We moved that, did not fill it as a deputy, filled it as an assistant superintendent, moved it to the instructional side. A few of those type of items in there. Charter school expenditures, which were up, we're estimating gonna be up about 800,000 are included in the instructional um, category, as well as BOCES, extended school years, the admin cost, about 6% for next year, that's in there as well. Pupil transportation, a big number in terms of percent increase, 26%, but 2.5, 2.6 million in that is the Ontario bus contract um, that we had to get into for the current year that we are going to continue on for next year. And then undistributed uh, includes retirement, social security, health and dental premiums, debt service, all those other items. And again, it's down about 1.65%. Most of that or all of that $1.3 million decrease is a reduction in our debt service schedule. And again, expenditures increased 2.58% equal to the revenue side. Taking a look at um, a graphic on that, just over 50% of our budget is spent on instruction with the uh, second lion's share being to the, all those other um, healthcare premiums, dental, debt service, uh, retirement costs, and those types of things. So in summary, operating budget proposed for next year is $237,297,901. It's an increase budget to budget of f almost $5.6 million, or a budget to budget increase of about 2.58%. The estimated tax levy is 110 million, 973, 280. That is uh, at or beneath the maximum levy limit for us. So we will be in compliant with the tax cap calculation. The levy will change as a result about $2,594,000. That is an increase in the levy of about 2.39%. As we look at the tax rate, again, these are estimates but our current tax rate for 1819 is $24.45 per thousand. We are estimating based on uh, information we've received uh, from the town of Greece that we will be somewhere between 24.55 and 24.67 or 0.39% to 0.88%. Um, our best guess at this point is it will be somewhere around 0.5% increase. It won't, it, may, it won't be as low as 0.39 may not be as high as 0.88, but we're thinking somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6% uh, increase in the tax rate for next year. So how does that fare against other districts within the county is what this graph uh, is looking to show. All 17 uh, districts are included in this graph. 
The yellow bar represents the Monroe County average for 2018. The red bar represents where we currently are for, eight, uh, for the 18-19 school year at $24.45. And again, I chose uh, $24.57 as our best guess, which again is about 0.5 or 1% is represented by the green bar. So again, compared to the other districts uh, in the county, we're right around the middle, not the highest, we're not the lowest, we're right around the middle. Uh, our tax rate compared to other districts. What else is on the ballot? Um, this year we have a proposition for bus replacements. We're looking to replace 25 buses as we have in the past. Estimated aggregate cost be $2,487,000. Of that amount, we'd be looking to withdraw $830,000 from our bus reserve so that it would be zero additional cost to our, rev our residents, and then we would finance um, the net amount over five years starting with 2021. And additionally, uh, we've got three uh, board candidates that will also be voted on come May 21st. Thank you. So these are just a few dates to keep in mind. We have April 23rd. Um, would be when our Board of Education votes on to adopt the budget. We have May 7th in terms of uh, having an official budget public hearing, April 30th. Sorry, I should have gone in order. Mm -hmm. um, the budget book will be available for public review, and that certainly you can get it um, uh, by 966-2321. Um, any one of us can connect you to that information or online. Um, you can find that. And then May 21st is the actual budget vote. So the, just some key dates that we want to remind our community about. I do this every year, um, and I've been called a Pollyanna, but I will continue to preach around voter turnout. So to me, uh, that goal three that we talk about in terms of having an engaged community, an engaged community votes. So that's something that we have in our strategic plan. I will not let go of it, and I will continue to work on, on upping the amount of voters who vote or who take it, or eligible voters who take advantage of that. And then also looking at the positive outcomes. So right now we've had a positive turnout. In fact, our number um, for the last, the, the capital vote was the highest margin in terms of positive votes than we've had in probably over a decade. So that tells me that we're on the right track, but we also wanna continue to make sure that people are aware of the date of the vote, where they can vote. And again, what you'll see here is just a reminder about polling locations. We were smart in Greece, and I would say due to Sean's leadership many years ago to move polling out of our schools. But again, we wanna make sure people are aware of the polling locations. This will be put on the back of their budget newsletter that comes when people look. Um, but we also make sure that this uh, information is available on our website um, in, in many places. So please make sure if we can do anything just to make sure that people know when that vote is and where their polling location so that we get as many people um, to cast a ballot. Um, I did not forget step five. We put this at the end because um, after the vote, we, we do consider that there's still a step, this whole idea of ongoing evaluation. So when we put together a, a budget, we are not perfect people. And we're having to make probably some of the most difficult decisions that impact people, program, and students. And we don't always get it right. So one of the things that's really important for us as a cabinet and for us as a district to do is come back and evaluate those decisions. So things like Romeo said around the facilities up. If we've cut too deeply and they need something, we may need to come back to the table and talk about that in terms of what we need to do or make some decisions or put that into um, our tickler for when we begin the process for the following year. But the whole idea of ongoing evaluation is incredibly important. We've identified just through this budget season alone, two key um, sort of pro uh, projects that we want to study throughout this year that hopefully could leave us to some budget savings for next year. So my point in saying that is just that we don't just sit down in, in December and start this. We're thinking about this throughout the year, um, and it is an ongoing process. I would end just by saying that I feel absolutely confident that we are putting uh, that we have put together a fiscally responsible budget one that is directly aligned to our strategic plan and one that meets the needs of our students. So um, I'm happy to, to share that with you tonight and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have as a Board of Education. Does anybody have any questions? 
Mr. Belsente? I just have a quick question about the TRS Reserve Fund. Mm -hmm. um, and correct me if I'm wrong. The benefits of us being able to do that are to better financially put us in a better position to absorb any variations in the mandatory annual contribution rate. Is that right? That is correct. Right. So we would be able to use it as a hedge against future increases in the TRS rate. They have been coming down, but there is information out there that they will start <coughs> heading back up. This will be able to hedge against that. And or if the rates do not go up significantly, we can always use some of the reserve to offset the expenditures that are in the general fund budget for the teacher retirement system. Right. So it's got two beneficial purposes for us. Any other questions? Dr. White? When we talk about moving stuff to grant funding, um, is there concern that those grants aren't going to be stable? You know, one, it might drop off and then we have to reabsorb it. How does that process go? That's a great question. So we haven't moved anything into grant funding that's not stable. So the, the grant fundings that, that we've utilized in terms of positions are things like our title funding, um, which we've seen a minor variation in, but not significant where, where we wouldn't it would be that much of a variation. Um, things like IDEA, they're really large sums of money um, that we can carry that in, and we feel comfortable that they've been stable enough that we're not taking risk by doing that in terms of those people or positions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I just have one comment I want to make. I just want to thank Kathy and her staff. Every year since she's been superintendent, they've expanded the budget so it's so easy to understand for the board and it's a tribute, I guess, to her and maybe a little bit the job we're doing as a Board of Education to see so many of you here tonight that weren't ordered to be here and nobody's mad, which is always good. Um, but I've been in a lot of these meetings where people have been very angry and we're getting rid of positions or SROs or whatever. So it's just been such a refreshing change over the last four years, the way the budget processes went. And I just want to thank each of you for taking the time on a Tuesday night to be here and supporting um, what we're doing in this district. And it says a lot about the direction that this district's headed. And I'm very proud, and I want to thank each one of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't have to clap. That wasn't a clap. That's fine. Um, moving on to item 6.01, bids. Can I somebody move the bids to the table, please? Moved by Mr. Maloney, seconded by Dr. White. Any comments, questions, or concerns on the bids? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes 9-0. to zero. The uh, budget transfers you had before, you can have somebody move the following. Be it resolved, Board of Education, Greece Central School District authorizes district administration to initiate the following budget transfers to March 2019. Can I have somebody moved by Mr. Velasante, seconded by Mr. Sawicki? Any comments, questions, or concerns on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes 9-0. to zero. Moving on to anticipated bids. It's information only. Does anybody have any questions? Moving on to the consent agenda. Can I have somebody move the consent agenda to the table, please? Moved by Vice President Moore, seconded by Dr. Trawick. Any comments, questions, or concerns on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'd just like to thank the extra classroom activity funds at Greece Odyssey and Greece Olympia and the American Heart Association for their donation to Craig Hill in the amount of $17,498.75. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Can I have someone move the following? Please be resolved. Board of Education of the Greece Central School District approves a 2019-2020. God, it seems weird to say. Um, board meeting dates as presented. Can I have someone move that to the table, please? Moved by Dr. White, seconded by Ms. Farmer. Any comments, questions, or concerns on that? Seeing none, and moving um, all those in favor? <laughs> that passes 90 zero. I'm one step ahead of myself. My brain's working too fast now. Um, can I have Sony move the fine, please? Be it resolved, the Board of Education at Greece Central School District will hold its annual reorganization meeting on Tuesday, July 9th, 2018, 2019, excuse me. Can I have Sony move that to the table, please? Moved by Vice President Lars, seconded by Mr. Maloney. Any comments, questions, or concerns on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? That passes 9 to 0. Now we're getting into board member comments. Is there anybody with any board member comments? Mr. Bosante? I uh, just want to compliment the cast and crew of Newsies at Athena. I got to see that. It was uh, another entertaining and impressive performance. So congratulations to all. Thank you. Any other? Dr. White? Um, just first of all, thank you to our robotics team. They came and gave us a presentation tonight. Um, I mean, 
not just an exceptional group in what they're doing, they were so articulate and able to explain not just what they're building, but why it matters to them, to their future, to their friends. I can't wait for my kids to participate in hopefully that group, 1591. Um, thank you to our superintendent and other board members. We attended a Black Women's Mental Health Forum at MCC. We got to bring some of our students with us. Um, and the forum was outstanding, but seeing our student, one of our students being the first one to walk up and ask a question of this world-renowned scholar on how she can check in on the mental health of her friends, uh, I, the, their leaders, our students among us, and it's, it's just great to be able to witness. Um, I have to do a little bit of angry news. I'm extremely dismayed by the testing situation. I think we all are. And to read that Commissioner Elliott today said she was very, very disgusted with what was produced by our contractor, that Chancellor Rosa said, I have no confidence, zero. I am thankful that in our district no data was lost, but that's not the case everywhere. And can we confidently say this won't happen again with our math tests? Why do we continue to waste our students' time, our teachers' time, our administrators' time with these assessments? I know we sent the letter. I know we stated that we wanted them to fix it to our leaders and our legislators, and they did not. They embarrassed themselves. They embarrass us as a state. I, for one, would be completely fine and confident in not participating in the math testing. No one's listening to us. We're saying, our unions are saying, our kids are saying that this testing can't continue. We're pouring millions in. When's enough enough? So that's my, my angry eloquent. moment. Any other board member comments? Mr. Swicky. So just to note again on, on the budget, right? So I was part of the budget advisory committee this time around. So just a shout out to the finance team again. It's it's a game of whack-a-mole while doing a Rubik's Cube and trying to play Jenga at the same time. So uh, awesome job, guys, because every time you think you figure it out, something else comes up. And, uh, you know, it's incredible work to get there. Um, and I know it's long hours, but uh, to the community as well. If you want to get involved and know a little bit more, I, I know Kathy had a slide on it, but uh, definitely get involved, get behind the, <laughs> under the covers, uh, under the hood, and uh, and see how it all works. Um, I think you'll be impressed. Um, I, I'd echo Mr. Valicenti as well. Uh, Newsies was awesome, and I was tapping my foot the entire time, uh, and tapping it when I went home too. So congrats uh, to the group over there. Any other board member comments? Vice President Laura, yes. I know you have some. Well, I do. I figured. Um, Congratulations also to Newsies and the cast of Godspell at Arcadia High School this past weekend. I love seeing student performances and our kids are amazing. Our robotics kids again were fabulous and I want to learn how to build a robot now because <laughs> they've got me so excited. Um, and I always try and find someone to congratulate or think about and today is the Greece Police Department. Um, as a teacher working at Arcadia, we always had a police officer around. It was fine to get to know them and watch them interact with students. But I'm so impressed with the fact that they're now going into the lower grades. And when I see pictures of them reading to students and serving food in the cafeteria and letting the kids see who they are, it's fabulous. Thank you, Grease Police, for your support. My comments, I'll try to be quick. Um, spring sports are getting underway. Hopefully the weather goes a lot better this spring than it did last spring. Um, I want to thank the robotics team as well. I'm only good at breaking things, so that was <laughs> very impressive from my standpoint. And like my colleague said, just a great group of kids, and they presented awesomely and did a great job. Um, I also want to thank the Greece Police, what Vice President Malore said. Um, police in this country get a bad rap a lot of the time, and our police department in this town has been a great partner with us, especially since Chief Phelan took over and Steve Chattering became our director of security. Um, our relationship has just grown, expanded, and for the effort they make in our schools and for what they provide us, um, just being there, doing lunch, getting to know the kids, it's an incredible resource that we're so lucky to have. Um, I wanna thank the BOCES, we went to a BOCES event last week, our annual meeting out of BOCES too, myself, Frank, Terry, um, Sharita, and Kathy, and it was an awesome event to see our kids. We had the most kids in the food service area. They did a great job. They were so articulate. They were excited for us to be there. It was a great experience, and the one, the girl that um, Joanne mentioned earlier, 
did a fabulous job. She did the presentation on the construction aspect of things, and she did a fabulous job. That kids go on places. It was unbelievable how well she did. And then on another note, Terry and I attended a uh, community schools event at, for education at Long Ridge last week, and that was just a fabulous event. We had two, I don't remember their names, but we had two great tour guides that took us around the building, and we learned everything that was going on. And it's just so impressive to see what's going on at Long Ridge and the after school programs and the number of kids that are involved and how excited the kids are about it. It's it just, it brings me to a very good place. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be on the Board of Education, like I said earlier, not sitting in front of a mad crowd. So it's great to see some of the wonderful things that are happening in this district, and it's credit to all of you and to Kathy and the rest of my colleagues on the board and the cabinet as well. I just want to thank all of you. And with that, I'm going to take a motion to adjourn. I don't get comments? No, oh. not tonight you don't. <laughs> you talk too long. You talk longer than Suzanne. <laughs> I know she's here, that's all right. I know. You're up for the year. You can't talk anymore the rest of the year. Sorry. So I, have, I just have a savvy comment. So oh. most of you know that I lost my dad two weeks ago, and I need to say out loud, um, when you talk about a community, uh, what an example of community we have right here. So I have never in my life um, been so humbled by the kindness, the love, the support, the cards, the gifts, the food, the amazing things that um, so many of you, I mean hundreds and hundreds of people have reached out in all different ways and I just, it just blew me away, it still blows me away um, at the kindness but also just the community and I guess what it speaks to is the culture that we've created in Greece in terms of while we're big we're still a family. Um, so I just need to say thank you um, and how much that has meant to me and, and to my family. My mother keeps you know, asking me to send the cards to her. I have a bag <laughs> that big so she can look through them. But um, I just really appreciate that and thank you. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Mr. Oberg, Second. Mr. Swicky, all those in favor? Okay, sign to zero. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.